Welcome to Cinemaholics. As most of you know, we mostly cover film on Cinemaholics, hence the name. But once in a while, we do like to dig into a new TV series here and there. And that's definitely happening this week with a new show that is hitting Netflix as of today. And that show is called Shadow and Bone. I'm John Agroni, host of the Cinemaholics main show, and with me I have a longtime friend, always super happy to speak with, Alicia Grouse. Alicia, how are you doing this week? Hey, I am fantastic. I am uh, literally just got done, right as we hopped on to record this, writing a giant 2300 word explainer about the magic of Shadow and Bone, so good timing. I, seriously, though, I could not think of a better person to talk about this show with, considering you are the most well grisha versed in this subject matter that I personally know. Um, but real quick, let's uh, definitely just what have you been up to these days? I know you kind of have a new gig, maybe at a website I think people have heard of. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, other than slowly going stir crazy um, <laughs> and having to learn how to socialize again, um, I'm very excited because I'm actually getting my first uh, vaccine shot tomorrow. Um, just doing a lot of work. I was laid off from my job, um, at Adam tickets, though I'm still working for them on a very limited basis. Um, but I am now doing features editing for screen rant. So we're going to have a lot of, you know, a lot of shadow and bone content, which will be fun. So I've kind of been immersed in this world for the past few days. I have as well. I have to be honest, I had no idea what Shadow and Bone even was, like specifically. I had heard of the book series plenty of times before. I think the first time I ever saw the cover or looked into the story from author Lee Bardugo was back when I was publishing my first fantasy novel. And I did that thing that a lot of fantasy novelists apparently do, which is you go to bookstores and you research and you kind of see how people are marketing their books. And I saw Shadow and Bone on a lot of shelves. So I was aware of it. I had never read it though. And uh, the first I heard of this series was actually from you, Alicia. I saw you tweeting about it and I happened to get a screener myself and I binged the whole thing. And that's why we're here. We're going to talk about what this show is, what it's about. And uh, I want to start from here before we kind of set things up a little bit, like what the story is. Alicia, what's your history with Shadow and Bone? How did you first get into the book series? Oh, gosh. Um, I don't even remember exactly how I got into the book series because I first read it, gosh, years ago. Um, I go through phases where I'll, you know, binge watch TV or movies and then I'll kind of get tired of that. And then for a month, I'll just be a bookworm again and blow through a bunch of books. And it was during one of those periods where I was really into um, just reading a lot of fantasy, but but um, more I was looking for more complex fantasy. Um, and not necessarily, I'm not a, like, I'm not a Tolkien fan. Like, I feel like, and I, I, I say this as a person that plays D&D, but books with, like, elves and trolls and orcs and whatever, it kind of feels derivative to me. So I really like, um, fantasy books with really unique and distinct kind of magic systems. And so I saw that this one had been recommended. It was a fairly new series at the time. And I read it and I... <laughs> No joke, I blew through the entire trilogy, I think, in a wow. weekend. Huh, yeah, okay. in a weekend. Um, so, yeah, and then I, you know, a couple of years later, I found out that the series was being made, and I was like, what? Oh, my God. So I've been waiting for this for literally years, this series. Absolutely understand that feeling, especially, like, when you start to get into something and you're just like, when is the movie going to come out? Uh, I feel about that way about a bunch of things at the moment. But yeah, it's it's great to see that this is coming to fruition. They're definitely trying something. You know, we, we've seen shows in the post Game of Thrones era try to adapt to the same success. And Netflix has certainly been on that course. They adapted the Witcher book series, also the video games. And that has been pretty successful for Netflix. And here they come again with, I think they're adapting something that some people call YA fantasy. I don't think it's, it's kind of just straight up fantasy adventure, right? Like adult fantasy, or am, am I wrong about that? No, I, I agree because I feel like a lot of people use the term YA uh, derisively, you know, like um, dismissively, like it's lesser quality or lower quality, um, which quite frankly, 
it is because it's generally associated with girls and women and genres that cater to girls and women always tends to be undervalued. But I think what Netflix has captured and what they've tapped into, because fantasy can be really hit or miss um, for every, you know, Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings, there's also King Arthur, Legend of the Sword, and like the Snow White movies, and um, or the Huntsman movies. I think Netflix has figured out a way to really ground the fantasy and, and capture that Game of Thrones, like gr grounded gritty fantasy um, sure. with The Witcher, with Shadow and Bone, even with Cursed, which is a little bit more fantastical, but it's in, and why and distinctly YA. Um, but I feel like this is a little bit more toward it leans a little bit more Game of Thrones in terms of its like kind of the political intrigue and the dynamic around it. Yeah, like the sheer number of characters. Yeah, Netflix is doing a really good job of. I guess kind of taking fantasy and, and bringing it down to earth, or rather I should say taking this fantasy stories that already exist that they recognize um, are a little bit more grounded and then translating those to screen. It's definitely an interesting step for, for this genre. I was thinking a lot of the Shannara Chronicles, that MTV show that oh, only yeah. got like two mm -hmm. seasons. I liked it. You know, I liked it. I, I think, though, this show really shows us how far we've come, I think, in terms of the budget, in terms of how ambitious it is. Ambitious it is. So let's let's set this thing up. What is Shadow and Bone about? I'll do my best to describe it. And then, Alicia, you can correct me on a lot of things, obviously. So <laughs> okay. we've, we've kind of mentioned it's like a fantasy thing, but it's not like elves and it's not medieval or anything like that. It very much deals with people, like human beings in a world where magic basically exists. And the setting of it is kind of like an alternate fantasy version of the time period, I want to say, between like World War One and World War Two, but like in a kind of Russia, like Russian Asian fantasy world. Is, is that kind of fair to say? Yes, except it's it's basically 1800s uh, czarist Russia. So there you go. Okay. Um, yes. So I was I was yes, a little bit yes. too far in the timeline, maybe. Yeah, the, the fantasy kingdom of Ravka. It's um, you're right though. It's kind of a world that's analogous to ours, where Ravka is a stand-in for Russia, and like Shu Han would be more of the like Chinese dynasty. Um, Kerch would be an, and Ketterdam would be like Amsterdam. So yes, you're right. Cool. So yeah, it's it's kind of taking this like Eurasian setting and adding this entire backdrop of actually magic exists and there are some people in this world who can use special powers and they kind of have their own little collective that is ingrained in, as you said, Ravka, which is like the main army that our characters are sort of tied to or affiliated with. And we follow a bunch of characters in this, but the main character in the story is a young woman played by Jessie Mae Lee, who I wasn't familiar with before I saw this, but uh, she is a very, very great actor just from this TV series. She plays our main character, and uh, main character Alina Starkov, who is an orphan who might have some very specific powers that can change the dynamics of this world. The main thing about this world, they really get it across in the first episode. It's kind of like, in a lot of ways, the main antagonist of this show is this magical sort of shadow realm that basically separates all these countries. It's like a metaphor, right? Where all the countries are, you know, the border literally is this negaverse, no man's land, where if you try to cross through it, you will get killed very quickly and very easily. And a lot of these characters are trying to figure out how to navigate it, how to get across it. And there's literal political gain that can be achieved if certain armies figure out a way to bend this it's called the fold if they can bend the fold to their will and our main character alina kind of gets caught in the middle of that so alicia yeah what, what do you think of the story as they adapted it is there anything you want to add to you about what people can expect from this show uh yes you were close it actually splits the kingdom of ravka in half 
So it's yeah, not there we the go. Whole, yeah, it's not the whole world. It's just the kingdom. So <laughs> this is this is like when I first watched Game of Thrones and I hadn't read <laughs> the books very, and I was I didn't know what I was doing. You're right. It is. I mean, it is like Game of Thrones in that it definitely does not hold the audience's hand. Um, and actually, it was interesting. I spoke with Eric Heiser, the showrunner and creator of it, and he and Lee Bardugo, actually the author of the books, as you mentioned, actually fought with Netflix to make it like this because they didn't want to have half an hour of exposition each episode. So a mm-hmm. lot of this stuff is backstory, and it's very much like Game of Thrones, where it's very complex, and they expect you to pick it up as you go. I like that, though. I like that mm-hmm. it didn't hold my hand and that I'm still yeah. learning and discovering. Exactly. And I, I don't feel it like alienated at all yeah. i feel more interested if not yeah else. so so yeah you got it right so basically the shadow fold is this um just swath of just impenetrable kind of living darkness that's populated it splits the kingdom in half and it's populated by these monsters called the volcra and so crossing it is is exceptionally dangerous but um occasionally they have to because what's happening in ravka is ravka is basically cut off from the sea and therefore all the ports and so it's slowly dying because it can't get supplies and making matters worse it also means that they're at war with other kingdoms um, because now these kings are kind of circling like vultures because it sees that Ravka is struggling and then on top of that there is also civil war brewing within Ravka's borders itself because the king is basically useless um, and just sits in his palace, you know, hoarding all the food and all the supplies and all the goods while people in his country, many people in his country starve. So it's a really complicated world with a lot of layered politics. And I think they adapted it really well. And what I'm most impressed with is that not only did they adapt the Grishaverse trilogy um, and the characters from that and the story from that, although the, this first season basically... Uh, deals with the first book of the trilogy, so we can imagine. I was going to ask that. Yeah. Yes, it we can imagine like that it. season two will be the second book, and so on and so forth. But they also Heiser also uh, weaved in characters from the Six of Crows uh, duology, which are completely different characters that um, have their own story in two different books that she wrote after she finished the first Grishaverse trilogy. There are a f- there's like one or two overlapping characters, but those characters were very minor characters in the first trilogy. So huh. it's set in the same world, but you can read them standalone. But those characters are also woven into this story with their own separate storyline that is completely original for the show. So you really have kind of four major storylines happening um, at the same time. And it's, I think that the way they did it is, it, it demands a lot of you, because uh, again, it's not going to hold your hand, but they did a very skillful job of balancing things and also fixing a few things from the novel that, or from the books that Lee Bardugo herself has said she'd probably do differently. Um, she's talked a lot about how when she wrote these books, these are basically the first ones she ever wrote and published. And so she was very, very influenced by the fantasy she read when she was growing up, which was very white, very straight, uh, very tropey in some ways. And so they take a lot of that and um, kind of change and update it um, and make it in some ways better, I think. So it, it's they've done a really skillful job of taking a lot of characters and a number of storylines and weaving them all together in something that makes sense and is balanced. I never would have guessed that and i'm assuming the six of crows characters are Mm -hmm. it's the thieving crew isn't it yeah it's the it's the i call i always call them the peaky blinders uh with magic Um, oh perfect yeah or well actually i will say not magic small science uh because that's another thing about the books and show is that it's not they're very adamant that it's not magic it's science because basically what the grisha can do is they can manipulate matter at a molecular level so yeah, so those that whole all of those characters are not even in the trilogy at all in the books. They're in their own separate two books. It's amazing because, like, as somebody totally fresh to this, I had no like to me it felt like it totally fit. 
And mm-hmm. I really, really, I think the reason this show works as well as it did for me is because of those characters. They kind of infuse this otherwise kind of tropey story where I always kind of knew what was going to happen. It was kind mm-hmm. of like a love triangle thing. And I was like, okay, you know, and I got invested. Do not get me wrong. Mainly because I think Jesse May Lynn is like so charismatic it hurts. And um, also, oh my goodness, uh, Archie Renau, who plays uh, Mal. All of them are, I mean, and also Ben Barnes of the Darkling. Like, this is the role he was basically born to play. Yeah, the casting is spot spot on. I, yeah. I could not. I have no complaints. It's just like you know, it's like a very typical thing. It's like go. Here's the part where the character goes to the academy and deals the with chosen bullies, one, but learns powers. The whole, yeah, it's it's the mm-hmm. chosen one trope, and and so yeah, I mean, totally. which can always be completely enjoyable. Um, it is. But it was interesting because even reading the books, I really loved the first trilogy, but it wasn't anything really surprising. Um, but then I read Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom, which is their duology, the Crows duology, and it leveled up in storytelling, in characterization, in complexity of characterization, I think. Um, And it's really fascinating because in the show, they basically like somehow managed to weave together a world that's basically like, yeah, czarist Russia with like steampunk Peaky Blinders and then in like Game of Thrones, North of the Wall with Nina and Matthias, like their whole story and mm, yeah. and and Mal as well. And so it's a whole, they, there are just so many different tones and, um, and, and feelings and they managed to weave them all together. So they feel like they belong in the same cohesive world, despite being extremely different. I do agree with that. If I, I have to be honest, if there was anything that I felt really stuck out like a sore thumb, mm-hmm. it was the Nina and Matthias subplot stuff. Because I was like, oh my goodness, this that's... is just straight up Jon Snow and Egret, like that's get, uh, Redux. fair. It's, yes. And, and some of that, it's interesting because some of these stories, they're telling a little earlier in the books. And I get why they are. Like with, again, with the crows, they weren't even in the trilogy and they're weaving them in and they're a whole new story um and then nina and matthias's story it happens later in the books in fact you see a lot of you actually get a lot of it in the six of crows um duology and so but i kind of understand why they have to weave some of the stuff in a little bit earlier um sure yeah so i think the advantage is that the world itself feels really big because of all these inclusions Mm -hmm. and that's why it works like i i think that if it had just focused on the grisha and and the little palace subplots and all of that i don't know i feel like it would have gotten old pretty quickly so i think it was a wise choice because every single time we went back to the thieving crew we went Mm -hmm. back to kaz and jesper and inej like my eyebrows always perked i always felt like i was hanging out with some friends you know like i i feel connected to alina and mal kind of like siblings you know Mm -hmm. it's like ah hey guys great to check in on you hope you're doing okay but then when i check in with the thieving crew it's like i'm with my buddies in the lunchroom and we're gonna get up into some mischief i mean i just i think it's a really great balance that they struck here because i don't think that sticks out at all and i was always so intrigued by what they were doing what they were saying what they were capable of it's great and all of the actors like everybody top to bottom, but especially the actors, like they knew the assignment. And like in the books, exactly. Kaz Brecker in the books is a, he's a mother, like he's, he's a bastard. Like, I mean, his nickname is the bastard of the barrel. Like that's, um, you know, because those who haven't read the books, the area of Ketterdam where he lives and grew up and now runs as part of his like crime gang um it's known as the barrel as in the bottom of the barrel as in the dregs of the barrel so um you know forgotten the lost yeah the forgotten the lost the red light district of amsterdam it's vegas it's all of that um and he is a bastard like he's just you kind of want to punch him sometimes but freddie carter does such a good job uh but then also at the same time you really want to root for him he's basically i always say he's tommy shelby from peaky blinders He's always the one that he's ruthless, he's ambitious, he's five steps ahead of everybody else, and he also sometimes really makes you want to punch him because emotionally, not great with that. Not so good with the emotions, but yeah, like all of them are just so cast so spot on and perfectly balance each other. So it's, um, I'm, I'm really, really impressed by how much they put into this world. And I do think that it may turn off a few people 
who have not read the books. Um, I was looking through reviews earlier, and I think right now it's like 93 on Rotten Tomatoes, so it has really good reviews. The one thing that, that, the one criticism I did see was that it's a lot. But then interestingly is I went back and looked at Game of Thrones season one because I was curious. Same exact um, complaint in reviews, which was that it's so much world building. There's so much going on. It's mm -hmm. complicated. And I thought, you know, it'll be fine then because people get complicated. Like we're okay with complicated now. So, um, so I think it's going to do really well. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, I, I first of all, we, we got to, we got to shout out the creator of the show, Eric yeah. Heiser, who put this yeah. together. He's the uh, screenwriter of Arrival. And yeah, I have to be honest, Arrival's not my favorite movie. It's a very strong screenplay, I think, but not my favorite screenplay. And I don't really like anything else that he's written. Uh, I didn't like the Nightmare on Elm Street uh, remake or the Final Destination sequel or the Thing remake. But I do think, oh, and he did Bird Box, if I recall. But um, I do think that... I, I like what he brings to this show as the showrunner because I think that he has such a great background in horror. So like, I think this show does really have to sell how terrifying the fold is. It's something yeah. that happens very early on and to, you have to sell it because so much of the motivation behind a lot of these characters is how do we deal with the fold? And mm -hmm. so he doesn't waste time in being like, the fold is terrifying. You don't want to be there. Everyone you know who tries to go through there will die. And it's very like Game of Thrones in that sense where he establishes those stakes very early on. And one other thing I'll bring up too, I never... I never, I didn't guess this going in and I agree that some people might have issues with like the world build, building being a lot of complex, being a little complex. I could also see people criticizing this as being a little bit too video gamey. Like the characters, I think when they start off feel a lot like video game archetypes, particularly like the thieving crew, it can feel a little bit of like, oh, this is my dragon age crew. You know, these are characters I recognize from like, you know, the Witcher or something like that. I think though what brings it together for me is the uniqueness of the setting and the fact that they did have a budget the fact that they did have they put time and care into the costumes the little details the that do make this insane. feel like Saras russia yeah and it, it makes this world feel alive lived in and mm -hmm. a, just a strong adaptation in that respect yeah all of the books um it, it, all of the grisha in the books their kefta that they wear those those embroidered jackets they i want one each order wears a different color and each class within each order has a different color embroidery um, on their kefta to denote what they are and like who they are and what they do. So, um, and every single kefta in the show is embroidered like that. And just like the winter fet scene alone, I just thought, my God, the budget. I cannot imagine the budget for this scene alone. So the costuming is amazing. And also, I really do also want to give a shout out to the VFX team and the visuals. I think it does magic in a really interesting way because something that I don't always love about um, uh, the way magic is portrayed in, um, in fantasy movies and TV shows and even like Marvel movies and TV shows is how fantastical it looks how um you can tell it's cgi you can tell it's very you can you can t it's very fantasy very magical very sparkly very unreal um where this i feel like the magic they really because the magic or small science of the world is rooted in science it's rooted in the world they also try to root the visuals in it so to sure. me it looks like what magic would look like if you if it actually happened in real life yeah they know how to pull it back when they need to yeah like when fireballs are like being thrown back and forth by like inferni grisha um they don't float and like flow through the air like they they move how you would think like a meteor or a ball of fire does um the heart renders who you know for people who haven't seen this are um, can basically manipulate the cells and organs in a person's body. Like when they crush a man's heart in a fight. Yeah, when they crush a man's heart in a fight, it's gruesome. Like it's brutal. It's not pretty. Like it's it's very brutal. And so I really appreciate that. Even the Shadow Fold, um, when I was interviewing them before, as Eric Heiserer said, they were they were like, how do we, how do we visually represent a swath of pure darkness? Like, how do we, how do we do that on screen? And so they tried 
this one way and I can't exactly remember how they did it, but they tried this whole thing and they were like, okay, and they spent like all this time designing it and they put it on screen and it didn't work. And they were like, oh God. So they had to go back to the drawing board. And so finally, um, one of the VFX or designers and, and uh, basically said, what about if we take the surface of the sun and we um, invert it like we do, we photo negative it and then play huh. with that. And so the shadow fold, when you look at it, because it has kind of almost these like wisps coming out, it looks like. Yeah. It's basically they modified it on. They inverted the powers of the person who can. They inverted it, uh, so basically it's the inverse of what can destroy it. Uh, so they took the surface of the sun, photonegated of it, did a photonegative, and then manipulated it that way. And that's why the shadow fo fold looks the way it does. So when you see those tendrils and stuff, that's actually um, would be like the equivalent of like sunspots and things flowing on the surface of the sun. But living shadow. I liked especially how it was stormy. It was mm -hmm. like, I never, I never knew like what could come out of the shadows at any point. It works really well, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, one thing I was thinking about, uh, one show or one concept I was thinking about a lot during this was this is why Netflix wants to make an avatar show <laughs> because yeah. the, this is showing to me like they do, they could like take what didn't work with the last airbender when they tried to the movie, when they try to like translate the fantastical bending of the animated cartoon, they kind of made it too limited too grounded mm -hmm. and this feels like a half step like in the middle which is like kind of a nice balance i was thinking a lot of like hey like th this is blood bending this is fire bending but like you know in a way that like feels real enough like i, I could actually see this fire being a threat <laughs> and yeah. uh, it doesn't take 20 people to do a very simple action like that kind of thing mm -hmm. so it's it gives me a little bit of hope for the Avatar show they're apparently still going to do. Who knows? But I I certainly I certainly am liking this wave of dark fantasy that we could get if this yeah. is another success for Netflix, especially. And it sounds like it lives up to the promise of the books. So I'm going to say, you know, I watched the whole first season. I was hooked. I had to force myself not to just binge the whole thing because I wanted to pace myself. I really, really dug this. I liked a lot of characters. I liked some characters way more than others. But I do think that, yeah, it all just kind of fits together with very few exceptions. And I, I just hope people are patient with it and that they don't turn it off if just because like not every single thing is, is explained early on. For me, I, I found it accessible enough. Like I understood, I think the reason that I understood what was going on uh, enough was because even though I didn't always know the details or where things were geographically or what brought people to where they were, I always understood what Alina wanted. I always understood mm -hmm. what Mal was trying to do. I, I understood what Kaz and Jesper and Inej were after. There was no ambiguity there. So that's why I think it should work. And I think people will fall for these characters in a very similar way that I did, I hope. But any final thoughts on the, uh, the Grisha show, also known as Shadow and Bone? Yeah, I uh, I agree with you. I think having so many characters is good because there's, I mean, you're never going to like all characters equally. You're always going to have a favorite. Um, and so having so many characters, I think, and so many balanced storylines gives people an opportunity to have a few characters that they really love um, and that they're rooting for. And I feel like the there will be a few people I think that will be lost and that will be kind of like turned off because they're just not in the headspace where they want to think about things. But the show, the show does ask for your patience, but it, but there's payoff, and I and I think that I think audiences now are smart enough to get this. Like they know, like oh, this isn't being explained at the start, but like I understand how this works by now. I know that this will be explained, so I'm just gonna be patient and roll with it because I trust that it will be all resolved or all revealed later, um, and I trust that you know even I think we're immersed in genre now and fantasy and sci-fi and comic book, you know, stuff. And so I think that there's enough shorthand there that people, again, can pick up on it. Like you said, like, okay, I know enough about yeah. this sort of thing that I'm not completely lost. Like, I don't necessarily understand all the details of the world yet, but I'll figure it out as I go. And I know, like, I kind of know the beats and where it's heading. So I'm, I'm along for the ride. I'm here for the characters. I love this world. I'm in. Um, so I, I would much rather have them be bold and take a big swing 
than than not. I mean, I figure if if we can wait for sometimes, you know, movies years and years for something set up in a Marvel movie to be paid off, you know, six movies down the road, people can wait for something to be paid off by the fifth episode or maybe even in season two because there are things that were set up that are not coming until the next season i would wager but um i think they did a great job shadow and bone is now available to stream on netflix all eight episodes i think they're all roughly around like 45 50 minutes something like that and very easy binge i hope you all enjoy it let us know of course what you think of shadow and bone by sending us an email or hitting us up on social media. Links to all that stuff is in the show notes. Alicia Grouso, where can people find you in your work? And do you have anything you want to plug this week? Yes, people can find me on Twitter uh, at aliciagrouso.com, or not aliciagrouso.com. It's been a long day. <laughs> at Alicia Grouso. And, <laughs> and uh, I have been writing, and a few of us have been writing, for those that want explainers and, and want a few you know, refreshers or breakdowns for Shadow and Bone. Um, you can find those on Screen Rant. We're going to be writing and publishing them all throughout the weekend for people. So um, I hope people read those and, and they help kind of make sense of the world or, or flesh it out a little bit more. Thank you so much for listening to our show. Be sure to subscribe to Cinemaholics on your favorite podcast app of choice or find us on YouTube. See you all next time.